Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. Okay, on the show today, Pedro Albuquerque. So he is a capoeira master, uh, originally from Brazil, but actually in my hometown of Cambridge in the UK right now. Pedro, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's really nice uh, to be here. Thank you very much. Let's hear a bit about your life story. How did you get into capoeira? I did not have much choice. I was kind of born into a, a capoeira family. And, uh, you know, my father was uh, a master. He's one of the founders of uh, the group Senzala, which is one of the oldest groups in Capoeira. So members of, you know, his brother was into Capoeira. His brother-in-law was also one of the founders. So I grew up kind of within that, that, that environment. Got it. So it's just, just kind of in the blood, as it were, yeah? Yeah, yeah. In a way, like it's people ask me when did I start, and for me, you know, I, there was an age when I started going to the actual, you know, to an academy to train twice a week. I was seven, but even before that, my father was always going to the the we call it hoda, which is the wheel, which is the place where we the circle where people yep. play. Stuff. So every weekend he had any available time, he would go on into a. You know, to, to take part in those in those hodders, per se. And was there something personally that hooked you? Because I, you know, I know Aikido families and karate families, and you know, often the child does a bit of what the dad does, and maybe he quits when he's like eighteen. But it's not always that he continues it, right? Normally, there's something that kind of hooks you personally, as well as having that family lineage. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's funny now because now I have kids, and I feel like, oh, this is where my father was. 40 years ago or so, you know, and, uh, and uh, I definitely started because I grew up with it. And then, you know, by the age of seven, you look up to your dad, you want to go to the, but he, he had a, a co, he co-owned a gym in Rio. And uh, I used to go there two times a week and I was more for fun. You know, I used to drive the one who's driving my dad crazy. But at the age of 14, my father came to the UK for a, a, a master's you know, at the University of Newcastle. Okay. And uh, before he started the, 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 the Masters, he went to the Nottingham Carnival. Uh -huh. And there, there was a little, that was 1989. And uh, he got into a hut. There was some Brazilian there from Brazilian community. That he played. Mm -hmm. And then some English guys approached him, some martial arts fans. Mm -hmm. And they they were curious about Capoeira. And there it was pretty much when the group was born in the UK, you know, like 30, 30 years ago. Okay, okay, cool, cool. And you're a karaoke then, huh? Michael Menosh? Yeah. yeah. Yeah? Who do you support? Who do you support? Let's let's have the important conversation before we talk yeah, about this is Another thing is like, it's on my mother's side, I, I, I am Botafogo. You know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I only grew up. I only saw my my team winning the state league when I was fifteen. You know, uh -huh. but uh, in my family, you are either Botafogo or you are a ghost for my granddad. Wow, wow! I'm a Corinthians fan. You know, I was in yeah. Sao Paulo, so I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Corinthians hooligan. <laughs> Not a big. I mean, it, it's more within the state that the rivalry is big against Flamengo and stuff. And actually, Corinthians is is white and and black. You yeah. know. Same colors as Botafogo, so it's uh, so it's uh, a cool thing. But yeah, so as I was saying, after the 15, when I was here, is when I reconnected to Capoeira, when we came back to Brazil. And then I realized, oh, Capoeira is a way for me to they open doors to different places. Now you go back to the beach, and then people were showing off. You know, you were like a teenager, and so it was a way for me to, to connect to different places because I lived in Santa Teresa, which is a neighborhood where you gotta go like in the hills and stuff. So I didn't have much, in t the average people in Rio lives in a building, right? In a flat. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I had a very different ex uh, experience growing up in a house. And uh, that was, uh, you know, it was just a, a, at 50, something clicked on me that I could be, you know, in the, in the beach in Ipanema, mm -hmm. chilling with a high middle class. But then I also had an, 
a door that would open that would allow me to go to the ghetto where most people from my school wouldn't dare to go. So Capoeira opened different kind of... You know, right, so you saw it as opening doors within the society. And then I guess if your dad's in, you know, in England doing it, you're like, oh, shit, this could be my ticket to travel the world and open up my life in a whole new way, right? Which if you're, you know, in Brazil and it's a long way from anywhere, you might be like, okay, you know, there's a ticket here, yeah? Yeah, it's funny because Brazil, in a way, is a very insular place. You know, like they, no. they really think that they're in the center of the world. You know, it's kind of real New York. A little bit in London, they have this kind of vibe, right? But you do get tired at some point at 25, you know, going to the beach and then going out. You know, the whole lifestyle is really nice. Yeah. yeah. And Rio is, is a really unique place. But I guess at some point I had like itchy feet and I, I, I never actually thought I was going to work with Capoeira. I was doing economics. You know, my father as well, although he was, he was a master, a devoted capoeirista, he had his career as an engineer, you know? So it wasn't ever like a thing for me, oh, I'm going to work with capoeira. Mm -hmm. At the university, I started getting some social uh, works in some NGOs that would allow me and, and put me in contact. And then I realized that, oh, maybe, you know, but I was, I was already like 22 and stuff, yeah. Mm. So we better define capoeira then. So people listening, they probably got some picture of like guys in white spinning around. They probably know it's from Brazil. They, yeah. they might not know that much about it though. So when you, when people say, Hey, actually first question, when you meet people in the street or you're in Cambridge in a bar and someone says, what do you do? You say a capoeira teacher. What do they say? Do they know what that is? Or do they have like a stereotype? What, what are they? It's a funny one. If you meet a, a British guy, European guy, it's you no know, custom. Capoeira is still kind of on the ground. It's not as on the ground when I arrived here, yeah. you know, but uh, it is on the ground in the sense that some people would have heard about it, some people never heard of, would never have heard about it. So I would say, like, I'm a martial arts instructor, I would say, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I'll try Capoeira and see what the guy knows about it. Yeah. And then so what, do, what do you have to clarify? So if someone says, hey, I've heard of that, is that the Brazilian thing? Like, what would be, like, your yeah, and then, and then, sentence? How would you describe I, I, the way to go about it? I, I just like, normally I like to say that capoeira is, is, like, uh, is like a conversation of movements, yeah? It has elements of martial arts, of acrobatics, of music, or even theater, but it's a game. And, you know, in a way, it, it's like a conversation. You can have conversations and you can try to make a point. It's like learning a new language. So you learn like attack moves, defense moves. Uh, movements to, to move around, either standing up or on the floor. And in the game, the idea is, is kind of a, a paradox because it's not a martial art in the sense that you are there for a full out combat, but you are there to get the other one. And at the same time, you need the other one to, to have a certain dialogue of movement so the game can actually grow within those, you know, combination of movements so it has to be a given and take kind of thing you are after each other in the game but at the same time there is a tacit understanding that you need your partner to, to for the game to to get better you know it's an interesting kind of knife edge or fine line that capoeira is on you know is it a martial art is it a dance is it theater like even the language you use is very different from any other martial arts you talk about playing a lot you know this idea of playfulness or yeah. It's a musical instrument. You know, I was doing martial arts at university and this was the late 90s and Capoeira was just coming to the UK. It was in some like cool mobile phone advert, maybe, you know, guys yeah. on the roof in London. And it was like, yeah, super cool. it was like kind of cool and trendy. Yeah, exactly you know, like, when I arrived in the UK and, and, and that yeah. advert on BBC really helped me to describe people in Scotland when I moved first. Later. Okay, because they say, so, and it was like cool. And it was like something that people didn't quite know what it was, but... And then I, I saw the guys doing it in the sports center and I heard it was a martial art and they were dressed kind of like Asian martial arts guys all in white. And I was like, okay, they look like martial arts guys. But their attitude was different. They were like leaning on the walls and joking and laughing. And then, and then they started playing a musical instrument. The Biam, Berimbao, is yeah. it? And I was like, uh, Berimbao. Berimbao. I, was, I was like, what the fuck, man? Some martial art and they're playing music? This was like, to and they're all standing in a circle. I was used to like Japanese martial arts where they're lined up in rows. And I, I, I went, whatever this is, it's from a very different place yeah. than the other martial arts that I've heard of, you know? Yeah. It's, a, it's a, I mean, because look, look at Brazil, right? Like Brazil is, if you compare Brazil and the Eastern civilization culture, I couldn't imagine something that's further apart from Brazil. Yeah. 
you know so it's uh, it's uh, it's quite different so there is there was like and everything in capoeira is quite recent you know capoeira was starting being taught uh, formally less than 100 years ago and uh, and uh, recently you know in the 60s our group was the one that actually introduced this idea of the white trousers the cord you know and then it was a start like from at the time as well the the, the military dictatorship in brazil which you had a push towards nationalistic you know sports and, and incentivize the culture so it was a combination okay we're gonna make it this proper because also capoeira comes from the afro-brazilian community in brazil right so the history is that it's coming from africans who have come over as slaves is that yeah. right and they kind of had to hide what they were doing and and it was pretty street back in the day it wasn't this nice peace and love middle class thing right back in the day right well yeah yeah this is this is the transition that capoeira made because you see like this is it also involves some of the myths about capoeira because the myth that you learn about capoeira is that oh it's a it's a martial art disguised in a dance and the story goes that you know back in the plantations the 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 uh, the, the people who were enslaved, the Africans, they were not allowed to practice martial arts for obvious reasons, but they could do their home dances. And then the home dances, they would you know, get ready to, for the fight. When the moment would rise, they would fight and break out, you know? But the actual truth, or at least the historical evidence that we have, is that Capoeira is much more an uh, urban environment than a rural environment, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for example, like mid 1850s in Rio, 35% of the population were domestic slaves. Domestic slaves, they had a certain freedom of moving around. They would go and do the shopping, that kind of thing. So allow them to go around. While in the plantation, there was, you know, it was a much more brutal reality, like seven years average lifespan of a slave working in forced labor, you know, uh, and, and there was no freedom of movement. You would go from the Sanzala, which is the name of our group, which means the slave house, the plantation, and then back. So this was the myth that was created about uh, uh, Capoeira, but actually Capoeira became kind of, came from the hustlers, right? Like people who would uh, either run away slaves, because also there were communities of runaway slaves near the cities, in Rio, in Rio and all the other cities, which that relationship variated a little bit. Sometimes we were bringing it down more. But basically, because of the freedom of movement, eventually they, they became like a, a kind of a, a mob that would be used for political reasons. So like politicians of opposite parties, we use them as muscle to either go to their opponents, to break strikes, you know, that, that kind of thing. So because it was a rough kind of fight, it was always outlawed. And, and Brazil also has a history of chasing and repressing the, the, the Afro-religion, you know, all the cultural, uh, uh, which we would like to call in Brazil the, the mongrel uh, syndrome that we have, until it's recognized abroad and it's seen as a cultural thing. And then now okay. Brazil absorbed the samba, the, the capoeira, you know, and that was the transition that it, it had made. So it, it came from something that had no music, just like drums and fight to something that gradually adapt to the to the local you know there were different types of capoeira but the, the roughest ones kind of died away and the only one that we have today is the one that fulfills a social you know a, a role within the whole idea of of, of the game you know like the, develop this idea of game uh -huh, uh -huh. we'll come back to that social thing in a bit i think as well and it technically it's very different from anything else as well right like people doing like kicks from a hand half, you know, one handed handstands and some of the movements. It's, it's entirely foreign to someone who's trained in an oriental martial art. Yeah. Like, like, I, like I'm training some Japanese arts and I can look at a Chinese Kung Fu and it's different, but I can kind of go, yeah, I can Taekwondo is enough like karate or, you know, that Kung Fu is a bit like a kind of another kind of karate. Okay. But Capoeira is something else. Like it's like a whole different animal on the kind of evolutionary kind of side of things. Yeah, it, it is because, you know, when it becomes like a game and we don't say we don't fight, we don't dance capoeira, we play capoeira. Uh, it's, it's, uh, there are some, so there, there are like the attack moves, there are the defense moves that is like moving in the space that kind of is more like the dance side of it. 
But then there is also the acrobatics, which is a kind of the showing off, you know? And then you add one movement into the other. And also, like, people are exploring more and more new ways of moving. So it's, it's, uh, it's constantly changing, you know, like what we see as, as a capoeira. But there are some typical spinning kicks that are quite unique from capoeira. The one the guy puts the hands on the one that was in the BBC advert, right? The guys had the hands going to the floor, the legs swinging, it hit, you know, the heels going through, and yeah, this. Uh, uh, but basically, what he does, martial arts wise, it that he works with the idea that's really important: the, the idea of perception, perception of time, perception, perception of distance, and through that kind of game and practicing, you get an acute sense. Of you know the the, the, the tough capoeiristas of the past were the people who could fight more than one guy, you know, and they would use headbutts and so it was the notion of distance that they could kind of fight in, in a, a kind of a crowd kind of fight, you know. But it's it's so even today on UFC you see like uh, Conor McGregor for example, he had a, a, a Israeli capoeirista coach. You know, oh, really yeah, on, yeah, 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 yeah. He really focused on this idea of, of the flame. So, like, Capoeira has something which is the fake as well. You fake that you're gonna do something and then you do, which is not uh, as far my little understanding of what a martial art you don't really it's there is not the idea of faking so much. Yeah, it's, it's boxing capoeira. and Capoeira. That's not a very Asian idea. That's very much in just in boxing and Capoeira that the deception yeah. is not a well, you could say deception is a part of some martial arts, but it's it's yeah. key to the faint this is not so key to say karate, you know? Yeah, so so this is this is the idea of of, of the game. And it has to be kept within the, the the balance, you know, the idea of the dance, the music, and and the, the martial art. You cannot just focus in one, because then it starts decharacterizing, and then it starts going off, you know, this kind of balance. There was a time in the '90s where rivalry between groups became so stiff that you know when you're gonna go and fight, then it, it becomes more and more like a, a, a kickboxing kind of match. Because you're, it becomes about who is the heaviest, who is the strongest. That makes maybe the players uh, decrease the, the skill of movements because nobody would try to be exposed because the other one could punch. Or So the idea was like, okay, we have to... Uh, uh, there is a, a level of violence, but it has to be in a, in, a, in a controlled environment. You know, like that's the role of the master, the guy who is playing the, the lowest pitch bidding ball. He's the one who lets people win. Who's the one who stops? So can people. someone actually win in a match? Is there like a is like do, is it like a competition where someone could get knocked out, or is it more just like the master says, "Hey, now this guy won," or like, or is it they no? Like, how does that work? How does that work? Well, in the game itself, there is no winners or losers. That's one of the concepts. There are like the moral winner or the guy who slips the other one, but you know the idea is that you should know how to kick and how to sweep and how to fall, you know? So you should be able to dodge the kick. You should be able to, to have different kind of moves. So there isn't, uh, the game itself does not have a competition. There has been many attempts and it's kind of a taboo thing within Capoeira if we should do competitions because mm -hmm. you can do competition in different ways. Some can take Capoeira out of context more. Mm -hmm. You know, but there are there has been and there are still at at the moment some attempts to make. I think Red Bull made a big uh, push last year and the year before, doing a couple of you know bringing the old guard of the masters and and doing a, a, a competition kind of system with judges and you know. But there's a, another side of things like oh, we should not do the competition. It's it's not what Capoeira is about. Yeah. But like, uh, yeah, yeah, thing. yeah, and like keto, there's a big conversation like this too. Like it's kind of taboo, and then certain schools have put competitions, but then it takes the art in a particular direction, so it changes it and it stops yeah. being aikido, maybe. So it's kind of a conversation in aikido too. And there's so much of life that's competitive. Just it's like people think that way, right? Like who's the winner? You know, like it's like yeah. people think in that way, and to think in any other terms is quite foreign for people that grew up with football and cricket and but rugby, like competitive sports. It's yeah, like way of thinking almost. But the funny thing is that having said that, there is no winners or losers. There is this kind of bravado in the harder, you know, who's the toughest one? 
it's just not that there isn't like a score kind of system, but there is this kind of thing like, you know, we have the circle of people, every single one who's in a circle can influence the outcome. The games, sometimes you can go more aggressive or less aggressive and it kind of builds it up on the momentum of the other one. Uh, the players go two at a time and the, and the, you can have different uh, rules how you join in. You can join one at a time sometimes or sometimes just two at a time that are also a variation among groups up to where would they let the violence goes until mm -hmm. you know, like some, some groups like to think oh, once you are on the floor and you start wrestling that's the moment you should stop you know but there is that environment that capoeira is a very wide universe with different groups from different places that apply different you know so it's uh, as my students i always like to tell them look if you see, if you go to Brazil one day and you are out and you see a hoda, never jump in. Watch it first. You see what the vibe is. Is it some razor exactly. blades between the toes shit or is it just like a bunch of nice university kids having a bit of exercise, right? It could be different environments. Yeah. Exactly. And the same can be said about here in Europe. You know, like there were some places in Switzerland that like the canton forbade Capoeira for a number of years. <laughs> Wow, would be like some guys coming in the show and staying over and then, you know, like just having crazy fights. But police, I heard stories of the police being scared of the, the actual couple police because you can get people literally from any kind of, you know, background. And you have to understand that Capoeira, the way of teaching and, and, and the whole science behind it, something that's, it's not that long ago, you know? It's not that, it's not like karate that there is like a founder oh, sure. years ago, it's something like quite recent. And it's something that there's, I, I believe there's still a lot of uh, uh, evolution to do, you know, like the way that they train. I think overall, lots of, it's still the same old, like go for a run, you know? And so the way of training that is, yeah, there was a, a lot of, put it like this, Back in the day, when I was young, you had to prove in a way that you wanted to be a capoeirista. Well, now, since I moved here to the UK 20 years ago, I try to make uh, anybody, regardless of their skill, uh -huh. that they do a class and they, get, they understand a couple of sequences, you know? So like the capoeira, the growth that it did, it really changed the, the way it's being taught as well. Yeah, yeah, it's a mixed blessing that isn't. It? On the one hand, it makes it more accessible, but on the other hand, people aren't necessarily having that process of commitment. You know, like I had one Aikido teacher, and for a month he ignored me. For a month he beat me, beat me up, and then the third month he started teaching me. And it was like, like he was like, "Look, I, it's like I see a lot of people. You know, a lot of people come through the door. He's like, I want to make sure you're committed. You know, like he wasn't trying to make it accessible to me. Quite the opposite." Yeah, I mean, it's a give and take in the end of the day, it's like the market will say, you know, like which strategy works better, right? If you take, like, say you have a hundred guys coming through your door and you, you got to see how it works. You know, like I, I, I try to, you know, make it accessible. And I understand that my commitment to Kapoor is one, the commitment of a brand new guy is another. And it's a relationship that has to be started at some point and you cannot necessarily demanded straight away from, you know, a guy to go like this. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of this uh, idea in Capoeira that, oh, this is how I learned. This is how I'm going to teach, which, you know, I try to see, I, I try to keep an a open mind because there is a lot of people doing Capoeira that come, the, the relationship to Capoeira was really different. You know, mm -hmm. so like people now from Europe, from United States, from Japan, are teaching capoeira, and their relationship with capoeira is different. The way they think about capoeira is different. And in the end of the day, is well, who's going to do better? You know, who's going to have a, a, a create the environment of? Because it's 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 more about creating bonds within the group. The idea, this identity of group, is really is really something strong. The group is a big deal, huh? So this is another thing I I saw that's different about capoeira is in a circle. And it had this tribal feel to it. Like in Japanese arts or Chinese arts, you said to see a hierarchy and there's a club, you know, there's a dojo, but the group and the kind of quality of togetherness, you know, from a, as a psychologist, it looks like a lot of what's called co-regulation, which is basically people helping each other with their stress. 
you know, we're in this together. We're doing something synchronized together, like a dance is done. Like, and this reminds me of some like African dances I've seen this group of like almost tribal kind of quality that, that, that to me is different than stuff that I've seen in this seems like less European, less Asian. Yeah, totally. I mean, I think there's a lot of people who believe that Capoeira was created as a tool to deal with issues that were faced by, you know, because it's exactly what you say. You go on, you have a tough, a tough life. You have to remember, like, back in the day, you were, like, slaves who were doing, or people who had, like, fishermen. So people from, a, you know, a humble backgrounds were there and would kind of play fights in a rough kind of way. And, and uh, but, you know, in a way, today, what it feels like is that whatever is happening in your life, stress the work family when you go there you break a sweat you know the the, the whole round thing the, the the circle things the holistic thing something that i think we as a species have been doing this for thousands of years of like dancing and clapping. Mm -hmm. so he has this you know it puts us into the kind of old things that not necessarily we do anymore but so it, it's it's really strong because you can feel the energy sometimes you know like the, the music is there and we also believe that the music being good makes you play better you know the energy interaction of everyone so you definitely like sometimes you i i tell my my guys and you know, i sometimes you come in you don't really want to go you're tired and you just go there you break a sweat in the end you play and then by the end of the class you like you totally forgot that how you were feeling before the class going in so it does has this idea of re-energize people and and to to be able to cope with the everyday life yeah yeah it reminds me of sort of like you know i can imagine like a village you know ancestors all together in the village and if you look at like pagan stuff from europe it's a bit like that or native american yeah. stuff yeah. you know where people are dancing around a fire maybe and the elders are there and then the young people are there and or yeah, sometimes that's one thing i've seen in east africa is like courtship rituals and all the young men are jumping up and down and all the women are like cheering and you know yeah. going on and it's like a whole thing and all the old women are there like gossiping and shouting and it's like a, like everyone's around in this little circle while this is going on and it it's and the kids are there like learning what's happening and how they should behave and going oh i'm gonna do that when i'm a teenager you know and it is like a whole kind of tribal thing and i think we've really lost that and it it seems to hark back to that in some way you know yeah. what i mean totally i i i like to you know i've been you know thinking a lot about this last years and i i i like to think that capoeira in a way is like an antidote break from the interview to tell you about our shop and a deal we've got on there and also about some events that are coming up so if you go to embodied facilitator slash shop and use the code use the code podcast podcast 50 podcast 50 podcast 50 is the code you can get 50 percent off 50 percent off anything in the shop and what have we got on there how to design training trauma for facilitators breath work leadership resilience uh, life purpose there's a bunch of books there's a bunch of e-courses mostly for facilitators trainers coaches yogis different ebooks but that code will give you 50% out of anything at all there in the shop so that could save you let's see up to a hundred pounds which is about $120 so well worth having that code go to embodiedfacilitator.com slash shop also on that website you will see embodiedfacilitator.com slash events dash calendar just look under events under the main title you'll see all the stuff we've got coming up for events we regularly have free online events if you're interested in embodiment we have them on coaching life purpose marketing or trauma all sorts of things so have a look at the events page you can see the different one day events we've got coming up related to the conference and all kinds of other stuff okay so all of that is on embodiedfacilitator.com and remember that code there that code is podcast 50 if you want 50 percent off anything there you go a good deal back to the interview i believe that capoeira came as a reaction to a system of slavery, you know, a system that was uh, uh, placed by, you know, dividing, even among their own slaves, they would be divided in different roles, right? There would be like the tough worker, the guy in the field, there would be the, the, the guy who would be the, the, the slave driver, there would be the one that would work inside the house and they would kind of envy each other for the different, you know, mm -hmm. uh, roles that they would have. It was also something that was based on, 
hatred, like the, 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 the racism, the color, you know, and what Capoeira comes back as the opposite of all that, you know, where there was separation and, and, and um, atomizing people, now what Capoeira does, like, boom, it really brings people together regardless of the social background, the ethnic group, you know, the religious beliefs, uh, you know, it really has creates this bond among people, which is like, you know, this kind of love, you know, kindness of like, oh, it's really cool. And, you know, like, like you, you just make a connection with, with, with guys. And, and for me to be able to have travel and see my culture being um, respected and, and people searching this, you know, mm-hmm. I've been, you know, there was like a film back in the, in the 90s, uh, Only the Strong, you know, and this film was like a, one of those v- films that went straight to the uh, VHS tapes. But that film took Capoeira worldwide. You know, that's the reason why I went to Indonesia. That's the reason why the people in, in, in Iran started doing Capoeira, people in Mozambique. So he really put this imaginative, uh, uh, he helped spread Capoeira out. You know, and it's, it's a film that kind of shows more or less how Capoeira would work. But, uh, but uh, it's, it's just amazing that you go to so many places that are so different, like Japan, Muslim and something to be proud of as well, right? Like, um, you know, sometimes Absolutely. Brazil has this slight insecurity, you know what I mean, towards it. Oh, it's better in America. Or I, my friends always used to say in Brazil, oh, Australia's like Brazil that works, they used to say to me. I want to go to Australia. That was always their fantasy, you know? Well, we call it the, the mongrel syndrome of Brazil. They're always looking up to, to, to the U.S. or to, to Europe, you know, something. Yeah. Historically, it was also, you know, I think until the 1920s, the official policy was like, look, we got to really bring more Europeans here to whiten the more the population and so like you know being white being equal to being more developed but it's it's this whole turn that brazil is doing is like oh actually no we we have a mixed population we have mm-hmm. you know a horrible history i think very few countries will have a, a history to be proud of except if you look at the last 200 years but brazil is particularly brutal you know and but even with all that i think that the only way to step forward is to really look at the past with 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 uh, sincere eyes and and try to make it better you know because it's uh, right now in brazil things are a bit crazy at the moment mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i think it look a bit crazy at a lot of places and it, brazil has a pretty different take on some of the stuff around race and ethnicity there was a different form of slavery there than the u.s wasn't there? It was quite a different system as i understand the history of it i had a, a black brazilian friend kind of try to explain it to me once and then it's like also the sort of fact that most people are some kind of a mix, right? Like, like in America, it's like you're white, you're black, and there's just a very few people who are mixed, you know? And yeah. now we could say on one level, we're all mixed, right? We've all got, we're all from Africa, or whatever, right? But actually in Britain, it's pretty clear. It's like, okay, there's an Asian girl, that guy's a black guy, that guy's a white guy. Whereas in Brazil, there's shades. And it's yeah. like every single person is some kind of a mix. It's very rare you see someone, especially someone like Rio, you see someone who's like completely clearly what an American might say is black or white, right? There's often some yeah. kind of combination there. Yeah, we, we even have this joke about this Brazilian guy who goes to the US, you know, and he comes back and says like, look, I don't know what the problem people talk about race in America everywhere that I went, you know, the black guys went and gave me the fist up, you know, and the joke being that the guy in Brazil thought he was white, but abroad, he was obviously seen as, as black. So the, the, what, it, what it means to be what in, in Brazil is slightly different than, than in the US. But the thing about Brazil is that the sheer number is, is, like is way beyond any like for example to have an idea the amount of Africans that were brought to Brazil was just in Brazil was the same as the whole rest of the of the Americas you know so like wow. of all slaves that came to the Americas half of them went to Brazil you know and huge trauma there right I mean like that trauma in the body that's there you know just from the voyage oh, yeah. and and it, it, that, all the shit that happened to people I mean like, do you think that still plays out in some ways today? Do you think that's in people's embodiment in some ways? Like, there's, there's a lot of people talking about this case, but I've never heard anyone in Brazil talk about this. It's, it's coming out big time with the whole, you know, this combination of this perfect storm with, like, 1929 crisis together with the with Spanish flu at the same time. 
and all this, it's it, things are really erupting in Brazil at the moment because it has um, the history, like the, the own making of Brazil is like this idea of this really cool country with, so you get taught this history, but when you look a little bit deeper, it's, mm. it's much deeper. I mean, Brazil was one of the last, was the last country in the Americas to end slavery. Yeah. And also the way they end slavery was, yeah. it's a very good parallel to what they are trying to do nowadays, right? Because the first thing that they did, they did, uh, the law of the 60 years. What that meant? It meant that once you were a slave over 60, you were free. Okay. And the parallel is more or less what they wanted to do with uh, social security, say your pensions, right? So they, they, after you worked all your life, the, the, the slave owner had no more duty to that guy. He was based on his own now. Okay. So you know? you're 60, you can't work in the fields anymore. You're on your own. It doesn't sense. You know, and, and I don't have to feed you anymore, you know? Uh -huh. and, and, uh, and then they did the same with the, you know, uh, the law of the free birth, free at birth. Because the first seven, 10 years of that kid, they, you cannot really earn from it. So you have uh -huh. to feed him. And then it, what it said, like, okay, so they freed the over 60s. Then they free those who at birth, which basically make the slave have to fend for their own, you know, siblings instead of the slave master being, you know, and and uh, and then only eventually that they they I think, yeah was the was the last country in, in, in America to to have the thing done, and then you know they were just let left to be. You know, there was, uh -huh. there was never been any housing, you know, system. So if you look at, at, at Brazil, even the people who fought in wars, they were not, you know, looked after. That's why the favelas, the ghettos comes from, you know, the time, the end of Brazil as an empire and the beginning of Brazil as a republic. That's the, the first, like, when people start moving to the cities and going to the hills and have their own shacks put it together, you know. Uh, it's good, it's good. It's good. It's better, but it feels good to get another perspective. You know, often I hear you know British perspective, I hear American perspective. Everybody bloody hears, and it's like you know I've got a bit of Japanese perspective. But somehow, like South America gets missed out somehow. You know what I mean? Like like it's not people don't know what it's like to be Chilean or Argentinian or Brazilian. You know what I mean? And if it gets yeah. that perspective, it's not really it doesn't quite fit in most people's narrative somehow. It's a little bit like ignored somehow. And the same in embodiment world, you know, it's difficult to get South American instructors for the conference and we have to kind of really go looking, you know, and then there's the language barrier there and, and there's yeah. even a language barrier within South America, right? Between Portuguese yeah. and Spanish. So it's, it's uh... listen back to Capoeira here then. So why do most people do it today? Like why today does your average guy or gal in Cambridge who's not living in the favelas, who's, you know, maybe not trying to heal some history of trauma. Like, wh what do they get from it? What's, what's their reason for doing it? I think, I think it's just that kind of feel good, kind of belonging to, to a, a thing. You know, you go in, you learn the first moves, and in the beginning, it's very intimidating and hard. Mm -hmm. right? Circle, everybody seems like they know what you're doing. And then it's like, oh, Okay, basically you do a cartwheel, you, you do a round kick, when the guy kicks you squat and you go on from that and then we're gonna teach you a few more moves. So I think it's this idea of, of first, after a few, few months looking back and doing stuff that you never thought you could do. Gaining competence, going, wow, I couldn't do that, now I can. That's kind of cool in any art, right? Just to see that you've come a long way. Yeah, and also the diversity. I would say the diversity of people doing this, mm -hmm. you know, and and uh, you you get people literally like here in Cambridge. We have you know people from everywhere, literally English, Scottish, uh, then people from Poland. You know, just Spain, everywhere people come in. You know, it, it's it's always going. So I think it's it's definitely this this. Um, this feel good kind of vibe of like belonging, okay, right? In, yeah, belonging. You go in and you yeah. see, and there's a whole tradition, the ritual of being there, of sweating, uh -huh. and then okay, now let's go out and let's go for a drink, or you know, and at the same time, it's, it's social, adorable. definitely social for a martial art. You know, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah, totally. because it's about what Brazil is. You know, like people are out in the street, they yeah. are having a drink, they are. Party, there's a lot of music involved. So I think it's also is a is a is an opening door to a Brazilian kind of culture. And mm -hmm. normally, when you are in a in a 
in a Brazil, in a capoeira class, you are with some, either directly into someone from Brazil that has a pretty different uh, background from you. So there is also this, you know, like it's a connection to another place and then people, okay, let's go to Brazil and see how it is. Now, after a while, it's, this is kind of what is expected from you, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that is this, I mean, also kids, you know, capoeira has been done amazing for like in Rio every single private nursery has completed we're talking about oh, wow. toddlers you know mm -hmm. and how you introduce storytelling with the imagination and how you play that you know with kids I mean with refugees you know Capoeira has done like an amazing it has been an amazing tool to 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 empower people who's been affected by you know violence forced displacement and, and uh, this is being measured recently since the, 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 the Iraq war. I went, I worked with a charity called Capoeira for Refugees. And that's exactly what they were doing. They were teaching and they were tracking the, how the kids were doing, the kids who were not interacting, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and from one, it, it takes, the, once they, they look back six months and they realize that 83% of the kids were feeling better after doing capoeira. You know, There's and a healing there, right? I mean, just that sense of belonging, right. sense of physiologically, sociologically, it's really, psychologically, you can see there's a lot there that's gonna be good for kids, whether they come from a nice, you know, good home and in inverted commas, or they're coming from, you know, real trauma and real trouble. And given the history, I guess that kind of makes sense. And yeah, yeah. I just wanna, you know, Charles Eisenstein, we had on this show, who talked about what we've lost from our tribal heritage. He says, look, you can't even imagine what you've lost because since industrialization yeah. we're we're so i can remember what it was like to grow up in a village where you knew everyone and there was community and i you know i don't want to idealize it but there was definitely things there that i don't have today and that was a pale comparison of what might have been there for my pagan irish ancestors a thousand years ago you know yes. so i go so i go you know that sense of what's lost and how how that helps our resilience you know whether we're a computer programmer in cambridge or a refugee kid it feels like that's only going to be a healing thing. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 been done a lot like this, a lot of social work, you know, because it's it's a connection. You know, when I was like in my early twenties, I started teaching in the ghetto near my house, and it was a rough place. Like at night, you would see armed drug dealers carrying like military grade weapons. But Capoeira, I had a connection through the guy who was the the. The, the, the people's association and I would I was teaching there and it was the f I remember this it was the first time that I felt like now I'm a citizen of my city you know like okay I, and th but also for the kid what he meant is this I had another class somewhere else and I would take them to I did place. this I did this I took kids from the favela to the business school and it was so weird for everyone because the kids are like I've never been in a place like this and the yeah. business people were like, we've never met favela kids who weren't like cleaning our car or trying to rob us or we were scared of. And I'd, I'd be on a date with some nice middle class girl and I'd tell her, oh yeah, I was hanging out in this neighborhood today and I got my hair cut there. And, you know, and, and she's like, you, what? You went where? Exactly. Because I had a green light. I had a green card. You know, I, I could walk wherever I wanted and no one would touch me because I was teaching kids. But it was... Um, this yeah. is not normal for most Brazilians to be... Because they grew in that, you know, like yeah. the house where I grew, with, grew up in, it had a favela out, out, outside my window, right? And I would, in front of my window, you know, in my room, I had the TV and behind I had the window. And what I saw on the TV never was the same what I saw out of the window. And then I realized, oh, well, there is a gap there. And it's, if you look from outside, it looks surreal that you're going to have people from the same city that just don't interact and next to each other people don't realize that it's not like another neighborhood they're on top of each other oh, right there. yeah real is right there you are besides one of the most expensive square meters in ipanema beach 300 400 meters from that you have a, a favela uh, cantagalo which is you know it, it's a ghetto where at night there are there is drug dealing there are heavy weapons around you know sometimes they're shooting between the police so there is this uh, this music that says Rio 40 graus, eh, Rio 40 degrees, eh, Cidade Maravilha, Purgatório da Beleza do Caos, like uh, the marvelous city and the poetry of beauty and chaos. You mm. know, that's like mm. all in there, all together. And yeah, it's just crazy that some people 
who don't really interact. Like some kids that never been to the beach, if they live like a few miles from the beach, they just never been there. So sometimes the capoeira is this vector that allows this interaction to happen, you know, and then some kind of the birth of a, of a coherent, you know, a, a society starts to be formed. When the guy from the ghetto and the guy, what they call the asphalt, you know, down the hill can meet and can know about each other's reality and, you know, hopefully building up. But even in Cambridge, like, you know, the average Cambridge academic, how often do they talk to a East right. European who picks uh, vegetables in the fields of Cambridgeshire? Like yeah. those guys are not fucking having a conversation normally and they live, you know, next yeah. door to each other too, right? It's not just Brazil. I mean, we've got our divisions here for sure. Yeah, divisions are uh, more or less, if you look in hard enough, you, you're going to see, you know, moving from Edinburgh to Cambridge, I was actually a little bit shocked because I thought that Cambridge was like just bursting with culture, you know, like, because Edinburgh, there's a big culture of like NGOs that do like, there's like live music, there's three, four, five, six different places that has live music. And when I arrived here, I realized that, yeah, there's a lot of like the brains of the world are here, but they're all in their colleges. Kind of. Behind walls, man, that was painful for me as a kid. So I was from a fairly poor family and I'd go to Cambridge, it's the nearest city, like 25 miles. And I'd go to college there, like high school there, because I was clever. So I used to go there. And um, I used to go past these places and they were like behind walls. You don't see and it. There was another, and maybe you'd see through the door as someone opened it, this beautiful 500 year old building with these gardens that fucking yeah. Darwin or some shit was in. And, you, and I'd be like, shit, that's the other side of the wall for me. I'm never, I, I still feel that pain a little bit when I go there, like, like I'm kept yeah. from that, you know? It is surreal because I, I recently started teaching at uh, Newnan College. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a woman's only... You know, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, man, you're Brazilian in Newnan College late at night with your reputation, Pedro? <laughs> Why did they let you in? <laughs> I, have a, a professor, I have a student who is a professor at, at Cambridge University and he got us a, a space there. But it's just amazing. There's just the sheer size of the gardens. Amazing, how yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, and a couple of times I've been inside those kind of places. Yeah. I, used to, I used to like have a, a thing where I was, where I was poor when I was a student. I used to kind of try and get in to get free meals because they have these big banquets and shit. And I used yeah. to like just sneak in and I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm with uh, John or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's all about the confidence you want. You've got a scarf, you know, you can steal one of these scarves when, when they're drunk in the pubs and steal one of their scarves and then you can just walk in wherever you want. But uh, <laughs> they're like 24 hour hotels, you know, with porters there all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's another world. Town and gown, they call it, man. Town and gown. It's not quite favela, but it's, uh, it's definitely a divide, you know, the class divide in this country. It's not nothing. It's not nothing at all. Okay, man. So we better start moving towards wrap up fairly soon. I mean, is there any aspect of capoeira that you feel like, hey, I want to set the record straight or people should know about this, like something to clear up or something that's important to you you want to talk about? I think it's, it's, a interesting, uh, it's an interesting journey, this, this what capoeira, because the people who do capoeira influence the way capoeira is thought and played. You know, so like coming abroad... Capoeira is becoming, it's coming from something informal to something more and more formal. You know, like it was known that if an event was supposed to start at 12, it will only actually start at 2. <laughs> I remember that in Brazil. Fucking hell. <laughs> Temple in Inglés, <laughs> yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inglés, you say, English time. <laughs> but here it cannot happen. You know, here people are leaving out of it. It's, it's a work, you pay by the hour, and, you know, you really had to to make that, that happen. But I think is for me, is is this whole, you know, because we are here right now, is, this year is the 20 years of that I've been in the UK living. And I was planning of doing so many things and then comes the, the pandemic and give you a two-leg sweep, you know? And, <laughs> You'll be back up again. You'll bounce back up, I'm sure. Yeah, it's, it's never a question if the sweep will come, is when it will When. Yes. And, and you, it's how you get back up that matters, man. That's, that's what matters. So we, I, I, for me, is right now, I just got together with a few of my friends and I said, man, everybody's broke and situation is bad. You know, like we're teaching online. It's new things are opening up online. This is also cool. But like, what can we do back in Brazil? You know? And, and uh, one thing that we are working now is that we started this, uh, this fundraiser. So like, we don't have any money, like, but we can maybe get, gather all our students and do a workshop together and to, to sort out, you know, buy some 
basic, we call it the Sexta Basket, the, the food baskets in Brazil to get some, some community going. So this is, it, and it exploded enough. And we raised like 2,000 pounds in less than 72 hours. And this has been a, a, a great journey because, you know, for me, I'm so grateful to Capoeira that, you know, it has taken places like Iran, Indonesia, you know, Palestine, Jordan. Cool. But you also, like, you cannot, we cannot forget of where, you know, Capoeira came from. And, you know, it's, it's about this, this connection that it gives and, and build on that connection. So I think... And when you look at it, it's actually what is the strength in Capoeira, what keeps people interested, I think, because it's really a door to, to, to understand that, you know, like the world like we live right now and people are questioning so many things and there are so many revolts and, you know, people protesting. And, and I think that it's, it's just the insight that Capoeira will give you by just looking at how things were and making us think of how we want it, and, uh, which kind of world we want to create, you know, mm -hmm. not on either radical sides of things, but to be pragmatic, to make people, because everybody wants the same, you know? That's everybody a great point, Pedro, as well. It's real easy to say, hey, I'm against this. And, you know, of course, you know, I'm against discrimination, I'm against racism, I'm against this. But then you go, okay, what, what would a world actually be like without that? Acknowledging pain, acknowledging different groups having had different history, different countries having different history, different ethnicities having different history, but also going, okay, what's the world we actually want? You know, uh, Charles Eisenstein says, the more be what, is the more what would a more beautiful world be like? And it's like, we need to look for microcosms of that. Like, like is it like the dojo? Is it like the choda? You know, is it like this? Is it like that? Like, at least to have some possibilities that maybe keep some of the things from another time that we can modernize and bring into in a new way you know the community and the we've talked about belonging and healing and community and the kind of yeah, these are the positive things right i mean yeah we've talked about slavery today we've talked about racism a little bit we've talked about egos and violence but it's also division but most of what we've talked about is that movement that play that belonging communities like this feels pretty positive to also be focusing on this stuff yeah, definitely. I think it's also like, you know, everybody has an opinion, you know, like everybody likes to have an argument. Like, and I follow, like, I like to watch things on Twitter and Twitter is a, is a crazy kind of world. <laughs> you like, 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 to like, like so much. Head, man. <laughs> but down to, it doesn't really matter. You can have the most amazing opinions or you can have the most disgusting opinions. If you don't do nothing about it, it's, it's the same. It's, you know, your opinion is as worth as the most despicable opinion if you don't act on it. And I think this is more or less where we're going towards, you know, where, okay, we, we need to, to do something that's outside our job, you know, mm -hmm. because what I'm doing back in Brazil is not part of my job, you know, but it, it feels like it, it builds a connection with me, builds a connection with my country and, and uh, you know, inspire other guys to, to do something similar. And I think that's more or less what we need to kind of, of go, you know, because before we were working, you know, 12 hours, uh, like you were slaves or you had like kids down the mine and things are not like this anymore. But okay, now we are working eight hours, but can you actually have a, a, a valid, can you make, can you have a view about the world you live today, if you work eight hours a day and you have to look after a family, you don't really have time for, you know, to have an right. you know, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Different, different kind of thing. Huh? And I, you know, I wouldn't compare modern situation with slavery in terms of, you know, I'm real clear which one I'd rather be in, you know. And of course, yeah, yeah. things are having been improving for sure, but it's, it's, um, it's just it's like a we're almost out of time. Uh, you know, I, like I, we, I don't want to do this the Brazilian way and go over because I'm gonna have, I'm gonna keep a German girl waiting. Sure, for her. Like, she's gonna freak out. So, um, last question is like, I'm just curious personally, how is capoeira like landing and changing in different countries? Is there, you know, you talked about this thing in Switzerland. Is it evolving differently in different places? Is it being influenced by the culture? Like you said, there's more systematization. Like that's just something I'm personally curious about. I think that, you know, regardless of which background you come in Brazil, and you're gonna, if you want to work with Capoeira, you have to, to give what the guy kind of wants. Yeah? If you want to go too rough, you're going to have only rough guys playing it. And as Capoeira is a community and other groups, they kind of tend to, to interact together. What they try to do is they try to find what works best. 
And what works best low over time is what actually stays. So in different places, you know, you can have like a guy who's a bit of a wild one, but then he's not going to do as well as a guy who is easygoing and know how to connect with people and know how to build a community better. But there is definitely influence from the place that you are in, you know, that because everybody who is in a circle makes uh, 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 the idea of belonging. So it definitely picks things along as it goes. You know, everybody who joins the circle uh, influence the outcome. And this is what is, it's, it's, uh, it starts becoming this broad, broad community. And, and it's just, it's just nice to see because it's slightly different than like Capoeira in Indonesia, from Iran, from here. It just depends on who is playing, what is, you know, it tends to, to have the same outcome in the sense of like the feel good kind of thing. But yeah, it's everywhere. It's, you gotta go with, you know, with kind of the flow when you are, you know, teaching. Yeah, yeah, I imagine Iran's a little bit different from Indonesia and different from Russia and, you know, places. Listen, Pedro, I have to go, but this has been fun. So shoot me a number. And if I'm in Cambridge visiting family, I'll give you a call and we can break into some colleges and do some handstands and shit. It'll be fun. And uh, where do people find you online, man? Where do people check out your stuff? I am, I am on, on uh, senzala.co.uk. That's S-E-N-Z-A-L-A.co.uk. And uh, we, have, we have a school here in Cambridge. We have a few other cities that are under my management here uh, in the UK as well. And uh, we have regular classes. Now I'm mostly on Zoom. You know, you can also find the details of our online classes on, on the website. Okay, cool. There. It's on the website. It says online classes. Yeah, so people can look that up. Listen, sir, obrigado. This has been fun. I've appreciated it. It's good to get to know you, sir. So, um, yeah, thanks for your time. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. That's it. Some ways to uh, get more, to give back, and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash embodiment podcast, and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodyfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're, most people I think listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodyfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites, this comments on there um the facebook group tends to be where people discuss things so if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into facebook there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on so um yeah i will reply to things personally there so um also on embodiedfacilitator.com website uh, there's all sorts of freebies there there's videos there's free ebooks there's ebooks you can buy and of course is our newsletter list if you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embody Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embody Yoga Principles teacher training then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there okay so I think they're the main ones tell your friends pay us some money on Patreon give us a review on iTunes uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there, Oof, bit long uh, pick whatever you like that works for you <laughs> <laughs>